Hey, everybody. Welcome to Etc. on the Vive Live. I'm your host, Kelly Barrett. Uh, thanks for joining me on this Tuesday night at a special time. I am super excited for my guest this evening. Uh, he is the man that was responsible for bringing us one of my favorite tunes on the planet, We Run. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Drew Arnoff from Strange Advance. Drew. Hello, Kelly. You're back. I'm back. You're back. How does it feel to be back? Well, it, it feels really good, um, especially since we just finished uh, doing some live shows. And uh, I remember the first time we went out on the road, I thought, I'm going to hate this. Um, you know, I started off as a drummer. And when you're in a, a drummer, you're in a safe position. You've got the shield of your drums, your cymbals and stuff. And, and you get to sit back and relax and just, you know, watch what's going on. It's like, oh, cool. The, the lead singer just tripped over a cable. That's cool. <laughs> and then when uh, when I started a Strange Advance, then I started playing keyboards and uh, and then realized, oh, my God, I'm going to be standing there in front of the keyboards and I've got to sing at the same time, which I, I never actually do in the studio. You know, I labor everything down separately. Right. I've got to play and sing. So uh, that was scary. But I actually really enjoyed it the first time out. And uh, so I wasn't sure ex exactly what to expect this time. But it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And, you, and you know, Drew, you guys took quite you took quite the the hiatus because you know it was in '85 when I, you know, and I gotta say this, Drew, you guys came out with a bang because you know you you came out and you had you know a couple of you had a couple of Juno nominations, you had two gold albums, your first two albums went gold, you know, you have this mega hit with with We Run, and then and then you have a, hi, a hiatus of a very very long time. And can you tell us what prompted that decision to sort of? King of the procrastinators. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, by the time we finished the third album and uh, and toured, um, you know, we were very tired and wanted to take some time off. And it's amazing how life just takes over. Right, right. Yeah, and and things came up and. Uh, it's it was so simple it was so and, and not to mention of course it was a huge shift in musical taste you right. know and uh and we had we had a, a record deal uh you know to we had arranged to make another album well we we fought really hard to get out of that record deal <laughs> we were stupid and uh <clears throat> yeah so uh we 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 got out of the deal and and I just sort of dabbled you know because I could afford to relax a little bit right and uh, and before you know it thirty years went by and uh, here I am uh, not it, anymore just like that and you know Drew you and I have something in common I've learned that you and I are both huge David Bowie fans oh yeah yes I mean you know like if there's one person in the world if you have to like narrow it down to one person David's my person and. And I know that you're a huge fan as well. And I, my understanding is that uh, David's death in 2016 may have played a part in you. Oh, it, it did. It, it was a shock, just a real shock. He, he wasn't one of those people that you thought, oh, you know, he's in trouble. I mean, you know, no offense, but meatloaf. It's like, you know, okay, you got to cut back a little there, meat. And uh, wow. but uh, yeah, David Bowie was just a real, just came as a huge, huge surprise, and. And and really, we thought if it can happen to him, it can happen to anybody, you know. So if we're ever going to do this, it better be now. But uh, I was actually talking to somebody about that the other day, and um, and they said, "Oh yeah, well that's pretty cool that you got to meet David Bowie." And I'm going, "No, no, no, I never met him. No, no, I didn't meet him." Oh, I was going to say, but but um, uh, in Vancouver, you know, a long time ago, uh, we were playing at a club called Oil Can Harry's. And uh, and our bass player kind of came up to me and going, you'll never guess who's who's in the club. We got to give up who? David Bowie. It's like you're kidding. So <laughs> what? I go upstairs. There's like three levels. I go upstairs and and I peer in the door. It's like yes, there's David Bowie in the flesh at a big table with his entourage. And I mean, surrounded by bodyguards and stuff. But whatever. And um, you know, go say hi. You know, introduce yourself. It's like, no, nah, I don't want to bother him. You know, it's like, uh, I, I'd rather meet him, bump into him at the studio or something. It's like, oh, you're you're recording here too. Or, you know, that's, that's that was the kind of, you know, vibe I was looking for. 
And, uh, and of course that never happened. So, you know, it's like, Oh, I had my one opportunity. <laughs> you know, Oh, well missed out on that. But, uh, the funny thing is actually uh, another one of my friends was at the club. Um, uh, Jim McCullough, who was the guitar player with uh, Nick Gilder, and uh, they had a band called Sweeney Todd. Right. And, uh, and just about six months ago, uh, Jim told me the story of how he was at the club the same night. I didn't even know he was there. And he and his wife, or his girlfriend at the time, were climbing up the stairs to the club, and David Bowie's coming down. And David Bowie, I think, had maybe had a few too many. <laughs> and uh, any. <laughs> And he grabbed uh, Jim's girlfriend and, you know, bent her over and gave her a big smack on the lips. And Jim McCullough's like looking at him going, what do I do? You know, <laughs> it's like, a bully. like, I don't know. I kind of want to do something. Yeah. I mean, do I give him a punch or, or do I <laughs> shake his hand? Or it's like, you know, such an awkward situation. So, but uh, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, later uh, I got to meet uh, Mick Ronson, which was very cool. And then uh, after that, uh, you know, we worked with Earl Slick, his live guitar player. And well, I guess he recorded with him as well. So I got to hear a lot of uh, Bowie stories and, and things. So that was that was great. But uh, no, never actually got to meet the man. Super exciting. Well, I, you are more controlled than I would have been, Drew, because I would have lost my full head and I would have ran over and made a complete idiot of myself. <laughs> you wouldn't have been the only woman who did that. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I'm not girl. <laughs> Yeah. Right on. Now we're, a few people are popping in to say hello. Hi, Joshua Rolls. Thanks for popping in. And uh, Doug Corby, always good to see you. Lisa Freakrock. Um, you know, I was listening to some of the footage you of your Vancouver show. Um, that was oh, that was just like a week ago at the Hollywood Theater in Vancouver. Yeah, two weeks ago now, yeah. Right. And wow, I just it just sounded so amazing. What did that feel like? Was there some a little bit of nervousness? So you kind of touched on it earlier, but the crowd. <laughs> I was ready to be hurling into the bucket. I was like, because it's after 30 years, you know, how's this? Yeah. Going to go? And, uh, and you never know what's going to happen. Uh, and, and there were like a couple little glitches and stuff. It's like, and your heart's just going, I'm going to have a yeah. heart attack or something here. But, but it came out, uh, it worked out fine. And, uh, and, and of course you've got huge amounts of adrenaline punching through your body and, for sure, uh, it's very exciting, and uh, yeah, so it was it was a it was a great night, and 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 at the end of the night, it's like we did it, we did it, we got through the set, you know, and stuff, and uh, so it was uh, it was great, lots of fun. Right, and I think I would imagine after a couple of songs, it just it's like riding a bike. I would imagine it it just kind of would feel normal again somewhere. Well, yeah, except for me because uh, again, like you know, when I started, I'm the drummer. Now I'm the keyboard player. Well, this time I stepped out to the front of the stage to sing a few songs. I saw that. I, and I'm like, you know, I'm not a lead. I'm not like a, a lead singer type of personality. I'm sort of more of the shy and retiring type. Right. So it's like, but I thought, I've got to try this. I've, I've got to, you know, make the attempt to do this. I've got to like, you know, push myself and push the envelope. And, and so that for me, it was like, you know, again, it's like if I just sat back and, you know, played the keyboards, you know, I would have been totally fine and comfortable. But because I knew it's like, oh, I'm going to go out and pretend I know what I'm doing. You know, You're like the front guy. Yeah. front yeah. Man. Great. You did great. And actually, uh, Valina Davidson, hi, Valina. She says I was at the McGraw Mississauga show and it was amazing. Nice. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. No, I watched some footage from it. And uh, and I understand you guys do a, a cover of Space Oddity. Well, we don't actually. I saw, we did. We did. I saw it written on there. That's where I. Oh, oh, we did it, but we, uh, I'm, I'm not until that uh, until we're sitting there on the stage, and uh, Sean, uh, our singer, you know, has had made up the set list, and uh, I'd sort of like let him take care of the the acoustic uh, version of the show, and uh, I'm sitting there going, you know, glancing down at the set list and going, space oddity, <laughs> we're doing space oddity, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> We we one time we ran through half the song. We didn't. We never even figured out an ending for it or anything. So it's like, okay, we're gonna do space oddity. Yes, this is happening. <laughs> and uh, 
And here's my funny space oddity story. Um, when when uh, Daryl and I, uh, before Strange Advance, we had a band called Slan. It was a cover band. Right. And, you know, we played the local clubs and stuff. And uh, our claim to fame was that we had a Mellotron, which is a keyboard instrument, but it plays back pre-recorded tapes. So if you've got a tape of a choir and you, you know, play that, it's the sound of the big choir and strings and et cetera, you know, whatever you're, whatever's recorded, it'll play back. It was like an analog sampler. So, and it was very expensive and very rare. And we had one. And, and we did a killer version of Space Oddity. And again, um, at Oil Can Harry's, uh, we were opening up for Hart. And Hart did a version of Space Oddity at the time. And someone, one of the guys in Hart said, oh, I see you're doing Space Oddity. Well, you can't do it because we're doing it. And I just didn't really like his attitude. <laughs> sure. right. So, so, <laughs> so, you know, we were given, you know, the directions. No, don't do Space Oddity. And then we just looked at each other and thought, let's do it twice. <laughs> so we, we, we did it before. They, well, they, they couldn't do it in their set then because we already did it. And we had the Mellotron and Daryl is a great Bowie singer, you know, Bowie like right. singer. So we did our killer version of Space Oddity and uh, and poor old Hart had to suffer through with Barracuda. or whatever. Oh. <laughs> Good on you guys. It's, speaking of the other members of the band, can you go ahead and tell us uh, the, the Strange Events lineup for 2022? Sure. Well, uh, Ian Cameron, of course, on guitar. Uh, he's an amazing guitarist, an amazing violinist, and he plays a wicked mandolin. So, so he takes care of like a, about a third of the band's music. Right. Uh, uh, Rob Bailey on keyboards and Ross Friesen on drums. And Rob and Ross uh, used to play in a band in Vancouver called 3D. And when we started, when we got our record deal, um, they thought, well, they're going to need a band. So they're going to call us, you know. And and I think, I I actually, they, he showed me an article in, a, in the Georgia Strait, the local sort of music newspaper in Vancouver. And it was talking about all how, you know, all about how they would probably be joining Strange Advance. It's like, well, it's a bit premature, you know. Yeah. And no one ever told me that they were interested in in playing in the band. So so for both of them, after all this time has gone by, finally, they're in Strange Advance, you know. So it's 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 a big thrill for them. And uh, Alex A. Train Boynton uh, from the Paolas, he's our bass player. Right. And uh, and Sean Dillon uh, is singing and playing guitar. And am I missing anybody out? I, I hope not. I hope not. I think that's about it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've got six people on stage. It's a big band. But, of course, we've got, you know, big shoes to fill there and uh, lots of parts going on. And we're not known for keep it simple, stupid, you know. <laughs> We just kept the stupid part, but the simple part, no, no. <laughs> well, the show looked great. It looked amazing. And I and I understand your next three shows are completely sold out. Well, those, those I just came back from Toronto last night. Those are the ones that are sold out. We just played those three shows, and they were all sold out. And very enthusiastic uh, audience. And uh, that was my the most fun part of the thing for me was, like, talking to the audience later, you know. For sure. You hear all the stories about how the songs, you know, had affected them and changed lives and, you know, saved lives. And it's just remarkable to when you hear all that. It's really meaningful. I would imagine. And I would imagine, too, Drew, that now that there's probably like two generations of fans. Like I would imagine in your audience, there's there's people our age and then there's and there's their kids that are. You know, that yeah. music has, the, the music has such longevity and, and mass appeal and still does. Well, you know, um, thank God for parents, you know, because they're putting on their old favorite records and stuff. And the kids are like, you know, grudgingly, oh, I guess that's a, that's not so bad, you know. And, uh, yeah, I, I was talking to somebody today and they were saying, you know, where where are all these young people coming from? And and I would I talk to some of them. It's like, oh, yeah, my dad turned me on to, you you know, and uh Right. And yeah, so it's it's really really cool that uh, it's actually reaching a new generation of of people, and and uh, yeah, we've got lots of young fans. 
Yeah, that's amazing. I'm wondering too, Drew, like how have the, the, the dynamics changed, you know, as far as performing goes, um, you know, pertaining to the 80s and then now? Is, is there a different dynamic, you know, now that we're at different stages? And uh, How do you mean? In, in terms of the music itself or? Um, just the whole process of touring and writing. and. Well, it is. Things have changed radically. I mean, earlier I was talking about the Mellotron. Well, back in the 80s, we toured with two Mellotrons, and they're a very, very finicky instrument. And they're very heavy, you know, in their road cases and stuff. So, you know, we were generally hated by roadies. <laughs> And, but yeah, like for instance, I my whole setup is on my laptop. I plug my laptop into my into my keyboard, and I'm playing every sound I need. I've got all the samples. I've got you know Mellotron samples that I'm playing, uh, my synthesizers and stuff. So there's no need to bring the actual synths out on 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 stage or out on the road. So it makes life a lot easier, For a sure. lot more compact. And I would say, like the technical technical end of things, has certainly uh, you know changed radically. Uh, so that's great. And and as far as everything else, I mean, the clubs, theaters, they all have really nice sound systems now. Whereas in the past, it's like you had to, you had to bring your own. And uh, and the lighting now, moving lights and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we do travel with our own. Um, we work with a visual artist who does fantastic uh, visual work, and he, and he's just all projectors, projectors, sorry, and um, it's really really cool stuff. So it, it adds another element to the to the story, and we carry you know lasers with us and stuff. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, technically more advanced, and uh, and it's lighter, and uh, and it's worked. It works way nicer now than it did back in the day. Great technology is our friend. Yeah, the stage setup looks good and the, the light show and everything is it's, it's just a stunning visual, which I think is such an important part of it. And we were kind of joking uh, before the show about, you know, the, get the adjustment to the sudden late nights and, the, you know, the traveling and the hotel pillows and all that. Well, and, that's, that's the other thing. Um, initially, we were booked to come out on uh, some, you know, red eyes, red eye flights. And it's like, you know, leaving at 1130 or whatever. And it's like, we're too old for that. We just want to show up at six in the morning and it's like, oh, grab a few hours sleep and then meet you down at the, the, at the show. It's like, no, no, we need a day to bounce back, you know. And uh, so, yeah, there's that aspect of it as well. I mean, when you're in your 20s, your 30s, you can sleep in the car, you can sleep on the bus, you know, you, you can make do with whatever you get. But now it's like we're old guys let's face it you know we need our our good solid eight hours sleep and uh, if we're going to perform anywhere near a uh, top level Peak performance i 100 I, I don't know how everybody did it back in those days and but weren't they wonderful times you know the 80s and 90s it was, it was such a magical time for music well you know i mean uh i used to pull all-nighters especially in the studio it's like normally when you mix a song you go in the, in the morning and by morning i mean 11 o'clock and and you work all day, you know, take a break for dinner and then, you know, maybe polish up your mix. And and if you're lucky enough, you can come in the next day and make a few adjustments. And but uh, but often, especially if the studio is booked by somebody else, it's like, sorry, you know, you can't leave the mix up and work on it tomorrow morning. We've got somebody else in the morning. So you've got to plow through. And and we pulled many all nighters. You know, we would get out of there like 20 minutes before the next band would come in to start their session. And you, you could get away with that. You could do that. You know, right. now it's like it would kill me. I'd be a dead man if I tried that now. 100 percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're getting a ton of comments in here, so I'm just gonna uh, so I don't get too far behind it. Brad Saibola, hi buddy. He just he's just saying no way. <laughs> you are not no way. He's uh, he's in shock. Uh, you see, hey, there's my buddy. He's just saying, great show. Uh, Richard Crooks has a question for you, Drew. He says, I wonder if you remember a band out of Calgary called Mystery Romance in the 80s. Do you remember I, that band? I do. I totally know the name, but I don't know. Uh, hang on a second now. Can you ask him? Or is it? Are you communicating with him? Uh, he's here. He's listening to us. He's saying he was part of the band, and we were signed to Current Records with Jerry Young. I'm sure you have mm -hmm. lots of stories about those days. 
Yes, absolutely. Loads of stories. Um, yeah, Mystery Romance. I, I know that there was one song there that I really liked, but I can't remember the name of it. Well, I'm sure Richard will let us let us know, Richard. Yes. <laughs> oh, Richard. Your songs and, uh... Okay, yeah, we'll just wait for him to uh, to reply. Speaking of his favorite songs, um, it's no secret to the people that know me that We Run is my literally one of my favorite songs in the entire world. It's been on my playlist all these years. It's on my playlist now. And so, of course, my obvious question to you is, what was the inspiration behind that song, Drew? Well, that's interesting you should ask. I was on the on the flight home yesterday. Um, I was talking to this girl who was talking about her dreams. And, um, I, and, and she had asked about the music and stuff. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, actually, dreams occasionally inspire me. Right. And, uh, and we run. I had this weird dream. And uh, and and I just basically was describing what was going on in the dream, and 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 I, I'm sort of loath to go into detail because you know music is a very personal thing for people. For sure. You know, like I can remember, uh, uh, I was a big fan of the song "Life in the Northern Town." Right. And, uh, yeah, it was a great track, and um, and there was a line at the very end, and it was like, "Take it easy on yourself." And every time I heard that, it was like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right. I got to take it easy on myself. You know, I, I can't be so hard on myself. And, yes. and it was meaningful to it. I think I, I think I probably even misheard the line or something. But for me, that's what he, that's what he was saying. And, and it was meaningful to me. And, and for if he was to ever say, oh, no, it means exactly the opposite of that. Oh, or whatever. It's like, oh, no, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. But anyway, I was describing a dream in We Run, and uh, I I just had these visions, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I was uh, I was on the side of a, a hill, looking down into a harbor, and there was a ship there, a military ship, and and I could see that all on the deck of the ship were all these bodies, um, and and the line "Frozen smiles for men returned." They right. never even left this place. Well, they were they were killed before they could go out, you know. Right. And, and anyway, that's that's what the line is referring to. And um, yeah, so I, I won't go into any more detail. But uh, and, and there, there was a girl who was dying on on this pathway. And uh, and, you know, and I referenced the girl in the song and stuff. So and that's unusual. I mean, I don't normally dream my songs, but uh but this one came from a dream. That's a really cool story. And what a haunting line, you know, with frozen smiles for a minute. Like I, and you know, truthfully, um, as I asked that question, Drew, I'm, I, I'm reminded of a quote of yours I read where, uh, like, and you say explaining, like you just said, explaining songs to people is almost a bit of a letdown because it is all subjective. And, and, uh, and then you went on to explain that one time a fan came up and told you how worlds away, you know got him through his divorce and and because that's what he thought the song was about and it really wasn't and you didn't have the heart to tell him no <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to ruin it for anybody you know oh. <laughs> and and yeah i mean it is a very subjective thing and whatever it means to you that's fine by me you know because uh, i'm exactly the same way i listen to music and uh and speaking of bowie in in the in the beginning listening to bowie that was pre-internet <laughs> And uh, and you couldn't look up the lyrics to any songs, so I would be straining to hear what he's saying, and half the time I'm getting awesome. all the lyrics wrong, you know. Right. But it didn't matter. Uh, they sounded good to me, and I made it into my own, you know, I, I, my own explanation of what he was trying to say or whatever. And I, I'm sure if I'd ever had had that conversation, he would have straightened me out. As a matter of fact, uh, that night that we saw him at. Uh, at Oil Can Harry's, a uh, Daryl did go up to him, and uh, and said, and, and you know, I guess he was a bit flustered. You know, what do I what do I talk to him about? What do I say? And and he asked David Bowie, you know, what is TVC one five? <coughs> and and David Bowie's like, it's about a TV that eats people. And that, <laughs> and that wasn't a very oh, good that? impersonation there, but yeah, it's like. And that was it. That was the end of the explanation. Like, oh, thank you, sir. You know. <laughs> Sorry, I asked. 
<laughs> well, that is the beauty of music, though. There isn't it that it's subjective and it's open to interpretation. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, by the way, Richard Crooks is saying that first single was called "So Far Away." Ah. Uh, is that the one we're thinking of? I think that. I think that was it. Yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. Right. Well, awesome. Thanks for answering that. Uh, thanks for solving up that mystery, Richard. Robert Young is in the house. Uh, he says "We Run" is in my top ten for sure. So, uh, speaking of Robert Young, by the way, Robert Young is the owner of uh, Writers and Rockers Coffee Company, who are my show sponsors. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Drew, we were touching on this a little bit uh, before the show, and I actually just got my new bag of Queen City Kids coffee, and um, we were talking about how cool it would be to have a strange advance We Run coffee. Well, that's a very cool idea. Yeah, and so Robert... Robert is offering you that. We're like, this is going to be a thing. We're going to get you some coffee. We're going to get a strange advance. We run coffee on the go. We have, we have a big couple of big coffee freaks in the band. So they would love that. There you go. So I'm going to hook you up with Robert right after we just show him. Awesome. And we're going to, we're going to get a, a strange advance blend on the go. I think that's amazing. Are you down with that? I'm down with that. That's that's on. On. <laughs> there you go, folks. Live, the way, live on the air. I love it. <laughs> do, do you have anybody that uh, owns a bank by any chance? Because I, I would like to be sponsored by a bank as well. <laughs> Wouldn't we all, eh? <laughs> <You're> so... <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it doesn't cost you anything, but no, that'll be a, that'll be a cool blend. Uh, so uh, Brad, Brad's Ibola says, Drew reminds me of my angel friend, Jeff. How good and pleasant it is for us to be in unity. Whoops, I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, think he's, I think he's got a spelling error going on. Um, yeah, Brad Zibola just says, let's get some people in the house. Um, oh, yeah, Richard Kirk is saying so. Uh, oh, here we go. Do reminds me of an angel friend, Jeff. I was just reading Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is for us to be in unity. Okay, now I got you. So, I'm wondering, um, do you remember, like, you know, speaking about We Run, do, do you remember where you were the first time you heard that on the radio? Oh, I remember the first time I heard it on the radio, but I could not tell you where I was. Um, I remember where I was when I heard She Controls Me for the first time. Right. But, Did that blow your mind a little bit? Were you kind of, were you oh, just kind yeah. of assuming? Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. it was amazing. It's like, we were on the radio? You know, it's like, yeah, that was weird. Because, I mean, you know, you're you're young, you're, a, you know, into music, so you're listening to the radio all the time. And and the other thing is, uh, well, first of all, when I first heard We Run on the radio, I hated it. I hated it. Really? Yeah. It sounded so weird to me. Uh, because, like, radio, um, they take it, first of all, you go through the process of recording the song mixing the song and then it gets mastered and you're used to hearing it on, you know, high quality speakers and whatever. Right. And you send it to the radio station and it goes through their system. So they, you know, well, for sure they've got their own compressors, limiters, uh, you know, uh, preamps, you know, maybe EQ, who knows what the, the song goes through a process before you actually hear it on the radio. And, and it just sounded so foreign to me. It's like, that's not how I'm used to hearing it, you know. Uh, but it, very quickly, I loved it. You know, it became, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it, it sounded great on the radio, actually. But it was just different from what I was used to hearing. Right. So, yeah, and uh, that was my reaction. So, yeah, it was, it was a weird thing hearing it for the first time. And so do you ever get tired of playing it? Um, I always wonder that when, when bands have a huge hit that's just like, transcended generations and like do you ever get kind of tired of playing it or do you still have a love affair with that song i still love it that's good to hear that makes my heart happy yeah because yeah. i still love to hear it too uh ricky lama ricky we just love you he's such a sweet fan of show he says when he's speaking to you drew he says we appreciate all the hard work you put in that we don't see and give us the pleasure to enjoy your music well thank you very much and that's so true um you know, Rob Bailey and myself uh, spend a long time programming and, and recording and, and uh, you know, rearranging and, and, and doing all. And, and Rob's going, no one will ever know, <laughs> you know, what it took to make this happen, you know. Right. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, we, we were ready to go a couple of years ago or two and a half years ago, whenever, and then COVID hit. Right. So, you know, we were like, 
ah, okay, I, I guess we're not going out. And uh, but it gave us more time to refine things, and and uh, and we made good use of our time. And of course, you know, put up the, the new CD and stuff. So uh, you know, it worked out for us. But yeah, there's there's so much involved, and anyone who's ever put a band together knows. You know, it's, it just it's not just like falling off a log. It's work. You know, you have to actually dig in there and do the work. So I appreciate that. Yeah, that's a great comment. It is not all glamour, and it is a lot of hard work. And it's nice to see a fan, you know, acknowledging that. And um, yeah. so, what do you, what do you, um, well, actually, before we get to that, let's talk about the new album, Strange Advance Four. Um, and and I just want to let everybody know. Uh, the, the website www.strangeadvance.com is scrolling across the bottom of your screen, so you can get all things Strange Advance there. Check out the music. Um, so, what what is the writing process like for you, Drew? Like uh, particularly pertaining to Strange Advance Four? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I, I'm sort of addicted to writing. Well, I don't know if it's so much addicted as I, I just can't help it. You know, I I have ideas. I've got to get them down. And the funny thing is that, you know, when I ha when I have an idea, I always think, oh, this is great. This is the best idea ever. You know, <laughs> where's my phone? I got to record this. Yeah. And um, I mean, I've got a studio set up at home and and uh, and I'm ready to record at a, at the drop of a hat, you know. And and I love everything I do in the, in the moment. Uh, the next morning I might wake up and go, hmm. And that didn't work out like I thought. <laughs> I last, you know, the, the the love affair is over. I'm afraid. But um, so I write on a daily basis, and uh, and of course I write. You know, if I'm inspired to do a polka, you know, or whatever, I'm I'm off to it. But clearly, that's not going to end up on a Strange Advance album. So then it's a case of finding the material that actually fits the, the Strange Advance, you know, sort of concept and vibe. And uh, and use that, um, and so it's uh, just a constant uh, winnowing process, you know, you know, throwing so certain things I'm writing into different categories, you know. I, I've written a lot of songs that would uh, suit female artists, you know. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, and and if I can find somebody that I I you know really love, uh, someone's voice and and somebody who would you know do the job. I'll I'll produce an album for someone like that, and uh, but anyway, yeah, it's just like going through the hundreds and hundreds of ideas and like you know what what sounds like strange advance, you know what would fit in that genre, and uh, and I'd like to think that it sort of moves ahead a little bit, progresses a bit, and um, but yeah, it's uh, just a case of constant constant uh, you know working on tunes and 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 at the end of the day, it's like okay. Yeah, I think this is this is good for the record, and and we've got so much you know stuff that we've recorded in the past that you know it's like okay, I'm going to revamp this, you know, uh, and yeah, it's 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 a it's my favorite thing to do in the world is right, create and right. right, yeah, right, and I love the idea that you you know that you can you can think outside the box and come up with songs and write songs that might not necessarily be for you to sing, but that you know they have the potential to you know to shop out to somebody else. It's just cool. Oh, yeah. Kind of oozing on another pore, so to speak. And uh, so, a uh, question here: uh, were, Drew, were you guys inspired at all by Flock of Seagulls? Well, um, not so much by their hair. <laughs> you know, so many Flock of Seagulls. First of all, they wrote some killer tracks, um, and and of course, their I ran had nothing to do with our We Run. <laughs> but, uh, a lot of running going on in the eighties. Oh, a lot of running. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Daryl and I used to joke, you know, where where we we do a lot of uh, crying, and 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 what else we and 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 we do a lot of running, you know. Uh, but uh, when Flying <laughs> Seagulls came out, first of all, uh, you know, people often ask about the name Strange Advance and uh, how did you come up with the name and whatever. And I still remember hearing the first time I heard Flock of Seagulls on the radio. I'm going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. There is not a band called Flock of Seagulls. That's the most ludicrous name I have ever heard. <coughs> but of course, it grows on you. And like, you know, five minutes later, it's like, yeah, oh, Flock of Seagulls. Why? Okay. Accept it? You know, uh, which actually reminds me one time, uh, uh, Bruce Fairburn, our, uh, the 
the producer of the first album asked if I'd go into the studio and and uh, and do some work on an Aerosmith album. And Steven Steven Tyler asked me, you know, so what's uh, you've got a band? Oh yeah, what, what's the name of the band? Strange Advance. That's the stupidest name I've ever heard. You know, it's <laughs> shut your dirty mouth. Thanks. <laughs> what a thing to say, right? Are you, you guys, you started off with another name. Yeah. That was, and then he found out that some German band had it. Yeah, we were Metropolis, you right. know, because, you know, we've always had that sci fi kind of thing going on. And, uh, and Metropolis was a very iconic film. And, uh, and so we liked that name. And, uh, and that we actually, uh, when we started to, to the, the record deal, the negotiations and stuff, it was a deal with Metropolis until we found out whoops, we can't use it because this German band has got it and they want like a huge amount of money. You know, give us 50,000 and you can have the name. It's like, well, we don't have 50,000. So we did. <laughs> we wouldn't spend it there. <laughs> and, um, and I'm happy we did, you know, because I, I like the, the the Strange Advanced name. Strange Advanced to me just has a, is way more of an 80s. It just has a, you hear that name and you yeah. think and you're like, the, yeah. the, you know, kind of like the two word names seem to. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great here. Uh, so G, uh, it's G I. So I'm assuming it's G Venuto is saying that he just saw you guys at Toronto over the weekend. Great band. Drew is a true gentleman. G is remarkable. We love G. We oh, you know G. Oh, he's saying to me. I know something. I just met her on the weekend, and I mean, I've I've uh, I've seen her on Facebook and stuff, but uh, that was the first time that I got to actually meet a lot of people. And, and G was a delight and uh, and is a big fan and we enjoyed uh, her company and and we'll be seeing her again uh, soon, I'm sure. But it was so cool getting to meet, you know, because like Facebook, uh, we have a, a fan club page and, and yeah. uh, an official page and stuff. And and people, you know, write comments or ask questions. And and for the longest time, I didn't really pay any attention to Facebook, you know. Uh, and then, but when I finally did sort of clue in, it's like, oh, well, I know the answer to that. So I'll, I'll, you know, respond. Right. The next thing, you know, oh, this is so cool. You know, I'm talking to Drew and, and he's giving me the low down and whatever. And uh, so you, you develop a relationship with, with people on there and, uh, and now going out live, we finally actually meet these people, you know, you can put a face to the name and stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. Isn't that amazing? Like, because you, you definitely get to know people by name. Yeah, yeah. You know their Facebook handles, and then and then you get a chance to meet them, and it's yeah, super super cool. So really she, and G's in the house today. How cool is that? She must be a member of the fan club. Either that or she's either that or she's stalking you. I don't know. <laughs> We're happy you're here. Um, so who are you listening to these days, Drew? Sorry. Who are you listening to these days? Oh, um, you know, uh, somebody actually just sent me. Um, uh, a photograph of uh, the singer from Future Islands who are in Red Deer tonight, of all places. And uh, and they're great. I love them. Um, but I don't actually typically listen to very much music because I've got this affliction. Um, I always have music in my head, whether it's my own music, whether I'm creating it or uh, I've just, I'm, you know, going back in my back, you know, mind's catalog and, and, and uh, there was a cartoon in the paper uh, and it was referring to uh, you know, the Beatles. She came in through the bathroom window. So for the past hour and a half, I've had that, you know, stuck in my head, but um, I, I never, I'm not, I'm never missing music. I've always got music in my head. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I don't actually listen to very much music at all, which I think kind of works for me in some ways, probably works against me in others, but um, I'm not chasing any sound. I'm not trying to emulate anybody. Uh, I just do whatever feels right to me. And uh, so I'm not influenced by other people. But again, on the, the downside is I miss out on a lot of great music. Because obviously there's you know great music you know being written and, and recorded every day and then and played on the radio and whatever, but uh, but yeah I've I've always got, I've got my internal radio station going all the time. Right, and you know something that you just said Drew kind of sparked me to ask about you know when you guys took the break and 
and I understand that part of it was that just that you just you wanted to stay true to you know you wanted to you had this conviction about the type of music you wanted to do, and when the music scene scene part of me shifted, mm -hmm. you just didn't want to follow in a path that wasn't you know you you just didn't want to follow off on a path that wasn't true to yourself. No, no, and the other thing is that you know I got into music production. And, uh, and I'd be approached by people. At one point in time, just before Strange Events, I had a recording studio. And, uh, and I would have to engineer sessions. And, uh, and a lot of the times, bands would come in. It's like, oh, this is not what I want to be doing. You know, sitting in a room with you guys, you know, listening to, you know, some really bad music <laughs> for weeks on end, you know. And... Um, and so, like, I, after Strange Advance, you know, when I when I took that time off, I didn't want to uh, have to do any musical gig just to, to make money. You right. know, I wanted to do stuff that, you know, that I loved. And if and if I didn't love it, then I didn't want to have anything to do with it, you know. And so I've stuck with that. And uh, and so, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, OK, well, that helps me, you know, remain original and, and, and sort of true to my original vision and whatever. So, yeah. I love that conviction. You know, I love that you weren't really, you know, you weren't willing to sell out. And, you know, that being said, though, Drew, do you, is there any time that you ever regret the hiatus? Well, you know. It's a 33 year. It's a long time. And oh. people, yeah. And, and people say, oh, you know, you should have done this, you know, 20 years ago or what, or 10 years ago or something. And I, I, that, doesn't, that doesn't bother me. I mean, it's like, I, you know, I live for today. Right. So we're doing it today, and that's today's all that counts, really. So I'm okay with it. 100%. And, you know, what, what makes you happy these days, Drew? I'm just going to shift gears a little bit here. What, well, what makes you happy these days, the happiest? That, that's a really good question. Uh, I mean, my, my automatic response is uh, – creating something it's like it's magic you know you're creating something from nothing and uh and and i love you know for instance when we were in toronto uh there was a day there where it was hot you know it was like 34 degrees or something and uh and you know and a lot of people you know that's a a great day for them you know woohoo let's go to the beach and, and whatever it doesn't do anything for me and uh and, and because I like to be in the studio, I like to be in that controlled sort of uh, environment right. where the focus is just on on creativity and, and, and making something happen. That makes me the happiest. I mean, and I do most of it late at night. And uh, and I'm just like, you know, beyond excited, you know, when I come up with a great idea or something. And uh, and that's what makes me the happiest. And, and, you know, and the other thing I like to do is walk. I like to walk. And, and I, maybe it's because it's uh, conducive to, to music, you know, and, and writing and stuff. Uh, but I used to, like, you know, take my Walkman out or, or you know, iPod or whatever and uh, go out at night and listen to my ideas and, uh, and sort of be affected by the environment around me. Uh, Actually, what it, I can remember what, at one point, I would uh, I recorded the the soundtrack to Blade Runner, which is uh, one of Daryl and my favorite uh, films, and and I would I would wait for a rainy night, and I would drive through Chinatown, <laughs> listening to the soundtrack to Blade Runner, it was very inspiring. You know, yeah, that's a good ambiance. Like when you, because I, I get a visual of what you just said right there, and I could see where. That would lend itself to you know creativity and you know just oh, like, well absolutely it was it was just the best you just felt like I'm I'm living this movie you know this is so <laughs> cool you know uh, but yeah I I I I enjoy film and uh, and uh, anything creative and anything that moves me you know that's really uh, I'm what I'm looking for the payoff is that if it emotionally does something for me then it's great and and here's a weird thing. I find that uh, recently, you know, maybe over the last few years or something, I'm more emotional than I used to be. Right, right. <clears throat> you know, and, uh, you know, it used to take a lot to move me to tears. You know, now I find like I'm, you know, I'm ready just to like 
you know, start bawling at the, the drop of a hat or something. You know, it's like if if uh, if I'm watching a movie and it's like a particularly touching scene or whatever, all of a sudden ah, and <laughs> the tears start. And so I, I don't know, maybe that's just because like I'm old and decrepit now or something. I don't know. Hey, we're not far off in age, so careful there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? In, in all seriousness, I'm the same way. And I, I love that you were, you were willing to admit that. And I think I think a lot of it does come from just living and having experiences. And, and you know, yeah. I, I just think you don't know how precious life is until you've lived and you're, and you do get a little bit older and then you, and I'm the same way. I will, I will see an old couple holding hands in the park and I'm a blithering idiot mess. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and then I think certainly for myself and you can answer this, if this applies to you, but I think the COVID situation really gave us an idea that life is short and, and, and things can be gone in a heartbeat and we never know. We don't know how much time we have. And I oh, think, sure. do you think the COVID kind of played a part in that sensitivity or is like added to it? It, it could very well have, uh, you know, because I've, I've definitely, uh, you know, I mean, in my life, I've lost a lot of people. Right. And, uh, and of course, the older you get, the more people you lose. Yeah. And, uh, and, and as I was saying, you know, when, when we lost David Bowie, it was like, oh, that was a slap in the face. And it's like, you know, totally unexpected. And uh, yeah, so that that definitely motivates you, and and of course, you know, you you realize, okay, the the clock is ticking. You know, it's not going to go on forever. That's right. And how, how sad is that? You know, right. And you know, in the words of Gord Downey, another one of my favorite artists who we lost. You know, no dress rehearsal. This is our life. And yeah, you know, I've got a good friend, and his his big line that now I've adopted as my own is, you know, get busy living, get busy living, right? Because we don't know. You know, we don't know. And uh, so I have a question for you. Will there be a book? Because I feel like there should be a book. That's that's weird that you should ask that, because just yesterday somebody was saying, you know, have you thought of writing a book? And uh, and I have not, although I actually have written a book, although it's a children's book. <laughs> cool. What's it called? It's called The Adventures of Princess Izzy Busy. And uh, <clears throat> and she's a frog. And uh, yeah, and it's 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 really cute. So uh, you know, I'll I'll see if I could get anybody interested in the book. But um, maybe it'll be a series. But um, but the idea of like, I mean, first of all, I love reading those those kinds of books. You know, this people's stories. You know, what happened to them, how they got to where they're at, and I love biographies and stuff. And and. Uh, and I never really stopped to consider, you know, do I have enough of that? Have I had enough of those experiences? But, you know, doing uh, what uh, last, like, uh, what day is today? Is today Monday? It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. <laughs> uh, You're Tuesday. still all It's all good. You just got in late last night. So. <laughs> so on Sunday, you know, we did this intimate and interactive show for Ed Souza in uh, Mississauga. And, uh, and people are asking questions and that. And and each question sort of uh, you know triggers you know more memories than that, and uh, and it's and it's great because like normally I, they're not at the top of my mind. <clears throat> Pardon me. So so when people do ask questions like oh yeah that reminds me of this and that happened and that reminds me of, and then um, now here's the other thing I've got a pretty awful memory. You know, there are some people and like Keith Richard, I remember reading his biography. I'm going, seriously, you remember everything you ever did? It's like, Keith of all people, <laughs> you know, unless somebody's following him around, you know, and uh, oh, unbelievable how Keith would remember anything. Yeah. But um, so I do have a pretty awful memory. But, um, you know, reminiscing, you know, definitely there are, there have been a lot of interesting things happen. And uh, and so maybe maybe it'll be a booklet, uh, a very very small book. <laughs> right. But, uh, maybe that would be a fun thing to do. And in my spare time, maybe I'll 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 make an attempt and and uh, and try to try to remember some of the stories. And and also, I mean, <clears throat> you know, you kind of like to think there'd be a, an audience for that book. And and I don't know if uh, if enough people would be interested, to be honest. But. Uh, but if there were, then I, I would I would definitely consider it. I think it's a great idea and what a legacy to leave. And I love the idea that you're doing children's books because to me, it's just 
I think that creativity, Drew, and I and I know you're going to agree with this. When you're born with that, as you are, as most artists, musician types are, I don't think we can ever stop doing that. I don't think it it matters what season in our life we're at. And that's what I love about the artists of today. They are still out there doing their thing. I've had guests on the show, you know, they're 70 years old. They're out doing, they're still out there doing their thing. And I love that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's a one. And yeah, you're right. You can't turn it off. And, uh, and, and I am like just an ideas person. You know, I love ideas. I love playing around with ideas and, and seeing where they go. Um, I actually have a, a method of falling asleep at night. I just, you know, turn off the light, close my eyes, and I start a story. You know, it, it could be inspired by anything, anything at all. And and I just I, I it's basically I, I it's I'm it's the beginning of a movie and I just want to see how the movie ends. You know, so I follow a character or or a circumstance or whatever and and I just play with the idea until I, you know, eventually just, you know, drop off to sleep and stuff. But that's the other thing that I, I do enjoy doing. I, I enjoy writing screenplays. Wow. And, uh, yeah. It's a lot of fun. And uh, and I get uh, so much enjoyment from it. But it's if, if you know anything about the movie business, it's like, you know, there's about 10,000 screenplays, you know, made for every one that ever gets, you know, looked at, never mind made. So I, I'm not under you know, uh, the illusion that I'm going to be a big screenwriter, but it's a fun thing, a fun activity to do. And it's all in the process. I think, you know, you know, the end result where it winds up is almost, you know, I wouldn't say it's unimportant or irrelevant, but I think it's just the process that gives you the joy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it's, the same, it's the same with music and, and getting back to the subject of death, uh, which is always a cheery one. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to die one day. And what's going to happen to all this stuff I've created? You know, it's fair enough. I've got records out. Those songs will survive. Absolutely. But what about all the hundreds or thousands of other things that I've uh, come up with? What's going to happen to them? Nothing. You know, so I, I really have to, like, you know, get on it now and uh, and put more stuff out there in the hopes that, you know, it'll reach people and and uh, and, you know, be important to someone. You know, and that's the other thing. It's like, uh, you know, having a hit song is great, but, you know, half the music I love was was never hits for anybody. You know, it's just they're hits with me. I love them. And uh, and that's the, the cool thing about it is like, yeah, writing a screenplay, writing a song, you know, painting a picture. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, if, if two other people like it or, or two million other people like it. It's like it's still the process it's important yeah for sure 100 percent. so Joe, what would the in retrospect what what advice would you give your younger self this is the this is the barbara walters portion of the show by the way <laughs> where we get a little deep what advice if you could turn back the clock what would you tell your 18 year old self for example 18 -year -old? Uh, yeah that's a really well you know something uh, i've lived most of my life in fear fear has played a big role in my life and fear just stops you. It does. You know, it just stops you dead cold. And uh, and and if I had some, you know, if I had, I mean, I I've had enough experiences and gone through enough to understand, you know, there's uh, bad things are going to happen to everybody. You know, it's not going to be smooth sailing for anyone. But you know, you can't let that stop you. You just have to be willing to go with the flow, and uh, and you know, and get through things. Right. You know, it's it's the saddest thing when you lose somebody who's you know you're close to in life, but you know life is the the important part of that equation. You know you're alive, they're not, but you know you respect and 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 cherish the the time that you had with people, but uh, you know you've just got to you know we're all here for some finite period of time, and and. You know, and one day, you know, we'll get the call and we'll be moving on to the next station, you know, where, wherever that might be. But uh, so, yeah, I would I would I would try to figure out a way to to let my younger self know, hey, face your fears. Right. Because you know, in the end, it's the, the fear is meaningless. It's it's just nonsense. Right. And uh, and there's really nothing to fear. You know, get over it. And uh, 
you know, well, it's you like, feel the fear and do it anyway. There's a, you know, like the book, if you don't just walk through it, you know, the only way out is through and the office, you know, the opposite of fear is faith. And you just yeah. have to think that stuff's going to come together. It's all going to be okay. We're all okay. Yeah. And I have to remind myself of that, you know, more so during the COVID when it was, when it seemed like the whole world was like, what is going on here? You know, and it's like, it's no. okay. We're all okay. The kids are all right. Yeah. You know, so I think that's a, I think that's a valid, you know, a valid thought that probably most people would agree with. But it's an interesting question to ask yourself, isn't it? Oh, it is. It really is. Uh, yeah. I've never actually asked myself that question before. Well, I'm glad I could put a first question for you then. And uh, what's next for you, Drew? Will it be Strange Advance 5? Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there definitely will be because uh, I, I recognize now that it's a wonderful avenue. You know, it's a, a way for me to, you know, get that music out there and, and get it out of my system. You know, because yes. it's, it's a wonderful feeling to, it's like, okay, I, I've given birth, you know, it's it's out in the world of living its own life and having its own existence. And uh, it's not trapped in my head, you know. So it'll be more of the same. And, and also, like, we really, uh, we played our first date at the Hollywood in Vancouver, and, and it was great to get that under our belt. But you know, the second show is better. The third show is better than the second. The fourth show is like, oh, so we're on a good path, you know. Yeah. So we'll do more of that. And also, it gives us the opportunity to actually connect with the fans. And that's so much more important now than it's ever been. I would imagine. That connection with people, you know, it just feels great. Great. So and well, you know, and I just, I think, I, I can't thank you enough for, I love that you stayed true to your your style of music and because really you, you know, and there's not a lot of bands doing this anymore, but, um, and I think I speak on behalf of everybody watching and all the fans is like, thank you for bringing the 80s back to us. You know, thank you for keeping us in that era because to me personally, the 80s is my favorite era of music, in, like hands down. Yeah. And, and it's so nice to see that you didn't sell out and you didn't change your sound to fit in with the grunge movement or or what have you and stuff. and so. And so really the fact that you're back, it makes a lot of people happy because you're bringing us that piece of our life. Our well, lives. yeah. You know, we're, we're basically reliving uh, an era that, you know, I've had that comment from many people. You're, you're reminding us of, you know, better times. Yes. You know, and 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 these, these aren't the best of times at the moment, you know, so we need a little whatever break we can get from it. And, uh, you know, whoever thought we'd be, you know, talking about uh, Ukraine and and the possibility of World War Three, it's like again, you know, we're we're in that same predicament. It's it's terrible. So yeah, it's nice to get a break from that. And uh, yeah, and and they were good times. They were simpler times. And they were the best. And you know, they're, they're, you're right, Drew. There's no better remedy than just tripping down memory lane and yeah. you know, just, uh, just being transported to a simpler time. And so and so, we just can't thank you enough for that. And I can't thank you enough for taking time to be with us today. My pleasure. Yeah, and uh, we just, we just, I wish you continued success, and uh, I hope that you'll come back and see us when your book comes out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thanks so much to my show sponsors, Writers and Rockers Coffee, and uh, everybody. Take care. We'll see you next Sunday with Kevin Finn from Queen City Kids. Uh, take care. Get busy living. Be really kind to each other. Bye bye. Bye now.